Informed Choice Radio, episode 501, The Family Lawyer's Guide to Separation and Divorce with Laura Nazer. Live Live. from Sundial House Studios, this is Informed Choice Radio. Radio. Want to make the most of your money and your life? You've You've come come to to the the right right place. place. Now, here's your host, host. Martin Bamford. If you're thinking about or you're in the process of splitting up with your partner, this podcast episode is for you. Laura Nasa is a senior associate solicitor in the family law department at Pennington's Manches Cooper. She's the recipient of the LexisNexis Family Law Awards Commentator of the Year 2019 and has won Family Lawyer of the Year Senior Managing Associate 2019 Gold and Innovative Individual of the Year 2019 Silver at the City Wealth Future Leaders Awards. Laura is author of The Family Lawyer's Guide to Separation and Divorce, How to Get What You Both Want. When a relationship breaks down, it is hugely stressful and emotional and often very confusing too. Who gets to keep what? Will I ever see my kids? What needs to happen and when? What if things get nasty? In this conversation, I chat with Laura about the practicalities of divorce and separation during the COVID-19 pandemic, how separated couples can work amicably together, and how a new law will remove the blame game from the divorce process. So here's my conversation with Laura Nazer, author of The Family Lawyer's Guide to Separation and Divorce, in episode 501 of Informed Choice Radio. So perhaps, Laura, you could start by introducing yourself, tell us a little bit about you and what it is you do. Okay, so I'm Laura Nazer. I'm a family lawyer and senior associate at Pennington's Manchester Cooper. I'm based in our Guildford office, although we've got offices all around um, England. Um, I'm a specialist in um, private children, so child arrangement disputes and financial um, separation on divorce or for unmarried couples on separation. Those are my my main core areas. Um, I'm author of the Family Lawyer's Guide to Separation and Divorce, How to Get What You Both Want, which was published by Penguin Random House in December last year. And um, what else can I tell you about myself? <laughs> it's quite a lot. I could keep going. <laughs> no, that's, that's, good. that's a good one by way of introduction. That's good to sort of yeah, understand and where you're coming from. And we're going to talk about the book today. Before we started recording, you mentioned that um, obviously the book did very well after Christmas. And, and listeners may be aware that post-Christmas is a bit of a surge in divorce inquiries for many people. So t- tell us a bit about that and that phenomenon. Well, so there's a bit of a contention over that within the the family law world. So apparently, I don't think there's any proof of it. Apparently, there was a statistic that said that the first working Monday after Christmas is known as divorce day. And apparently, the statistic is that it's the day that the most divorce petitions are issued at court. But so it suggests that everyone has an awful Christmas and then decides they want a divorce. The reality is we actually have a main surge of clients just after the big school holidays, so September time. Uh, okay. And we will talk to clients about the process and what um, the practicalities of it are and how to get through it. But what we normally say, you know, because that takes time. It's not an overnight decision to just get divorced. People talk about it for a while. They discuss it between themselves. And the process itself, like drafting a petition, etc. sometimes people take their time over it. So what we say is, look, don't do this just before Christmas. You don't want to have that Christmas where you've just started divorce proceedings. So people wait. So they've done all the legwork. They've prepared it. They've done the talks. They know what's happening, but they just wait until just after Christmas, to formally start it. So hence why that statistic, if it is true, is there. But the reality is it's not, it's not actually indicative of how, how well people's Christmases went. So it's, it's good to bit, bust a bit of a myth then, because we often think it's because families of or couples have spent two weeks cooped up together, uh, <laughs> they realise they hate each other, and then they go and immediately file for divorce. But as you say, there's, there's sort of regular times in the year when you see an upsurge in inquiries. And of yeah. course, this year, we've had a very unusual circumstance where lots of couples have been cooped up in the house together for two, mm-hmm. three months. So what, what's the impact of COVID-19 been on divorce inquiries? It's been, yeah, it's been unusual. So the usual pattern, I think, for those who are divorcing that want children, it's very much around their education. Look, let's not disturb them before they've got exams. Let's wait until we get through the summer. Let's wait until after Christmas. That's kind of the usual plan. So COVID 
everyone's in lockdown. So for anyone who has gone into lockdown already knowing that their relationship may be on the rocks or um, it's, it's maybe already having made the decision that they want to separate, that has been really tough. We've had a lot of inquiries from that perspective of this has crystallized for me that definitely I do want to go down that divorce route. And so, you know, starting that process um, which is really easy to do. We're all working from home. We're all doing Zoom meetings. I can still see clients and do work. The courts are still open, even though they're not actually in the courthouses. Um, but for others, actually, so I've, ha- I've, had, I've had some reconciliations, <laughs> which is the nice side of it. Um, but I think the, the, the main issues that have really come out of COVID have been domestic abuse situations. That's been a real concern right. for a lot of people where you're already... Uh, in a very difficult situation and then to have the government tell you you've got to stay inside your four walls in that abusive relationship has been difficult I mean the government isn't saying that the government aren't allowing people to move out etc but um, for those who aren't quite mentally ready for that or haven't got the support to get through that that's been really difficult and I think there has been a rise of domestic abuse incidents Um, those who are already separated during covid and have children together, that's been probably my biggest surge of inquiries. What do we do with the children? We're in lockdown. It really wasn't helped at the very beginning when the government said everyone's in lockdown. We had different ministers going on national TV programs telling people the wrong information. Um, So the the, the rules are that children can move between homes, um, even during lockdown, to see parents. Um, And obviously now that's been lifted slightly, single parent families are now allowed to bubble up with another family. And so there's a slightly bigger um, circle that people can interact with now. But that has been a big concern because where people have had arrangements with children are, for example, one week on, one week off or alternating weekends. Mm -hmm. That hasn't always been possible because you can't use public transport to go and collect your child. Or um, if someone's at high risk, you're living with someone who's shielding, um, the children themselves are particularly vulnerable, or or one of the parents or children have become sick. All of these issues have have, have been flared up. And it's been a real contention um, period because people are saying, well, one parent says, I don't want to take any more risks and absolutely necessary. Another parent might say, oh, come on, we can do this. This is fine. So there's been conflicts. The, the, the most recent conflict has been the return to school for some. One parent may say, that's a risk I'm not willing to take. I want to keep the child home. The other one's saying, no, I want the child to go back. Um, so that it really has kind of caused its own um, issues. Mm. But generally, from a divorce perspective, for those who are already going through the process, the financial separation, that's been a bit of a problem because uh, values of assets may have changed, property prices, business valuations, whether or not you've even got a job, um, your income maybe ha- has decreased uh, temporarily, or you may have been made redundant or lost your job entirely. So there, there really have has been um, worry. People are worried, and it depends on the case and what the finances are. Um, there's also been issues where people have only just reached settlement, and then COVID happened, and actually, you know, for some they can no longer afford to comply with that settlement that they reached, um, and. There's a lot of chat about um, things called a barter event and whether a an event post settlement is a, a sufficient to warrant a appeal or a set aside, so a complete uh, rewrite or a variation application. So, what, what would an example of a barter event be? What, what would that look like? So, the reason why it's called a barter event is after the initial the case of barter and barter, where post separation the um, one spouse committed suicide, right. and um, the other spouse saying, "Well, I don't, I shouldn't now be bound to the settlement rules because, um, you know, I the, the circumstances are now significantly changed." The, the rules are that the event has to be unforeseen and unforeseeable. Um, there, in the previous financial crash, we had this kind of situation where, for example, bankers were suddenly a whole industry were out of jobs. 
um, property prices crashed and there were test cases then, was that a barter event? And at the time, there was a big test case that said, no, the volatility of a property market was not a barter event. But it's case by case. um, And it depends on the situation. You know, did the parties reach agreement by consent? Did, um, was it, was it potential? You know, we all know that there's potential for the property market to go up and down. It's just by how much. Um, um, You know, if it's a your business, obviously, each business is going to be different, so it's going to be affected in different ways. Um, how foreseeable or um, could that have been? You know, could you have predicted that there may have been changes in the economy that would cause this? So, um, it's, it's it's a case by case situation that a family lawyer would really need to come in and review in detail. There is no kind of formulaic mm. yes or no answer. So, so while nobody would have really foreseen COVID nineteen, we would have expected during the normal economic cycle for the markets to go up and down and, and for circumstances to change. So we we could argue it wasn't entirely unforeseeable that there'd be a crash at some point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's also you know. When you reach financial settlement, it doesn't tend to just be about one asset. So it tends to be about a whole portfolio of a property, some shareholdings, etc. So it could be that you're looking at the effect on just one specific asset. And in which case, that might be appropriate to change your agreement for that specific asset. Or it might be that you need to change the whole agreement. Mm. Um, I think the most likely situation right now is rather than a barter and a complete set aside, so a complete rewrite, um, it's more about looking at what is possible to vary a variation application. So things like maintenance, if you can't afford it because you've just lost your job, mm. there is the potential to vary um, and looking more at those side of the, the already agreed settlements. Just just going back for a moment to some of the practicalities of, of COVID-19 and separation and divorce, particularly with children involved, who who makes the decision, the ultimate decision, when there's a disagreement between both sides, both parents, over, for example, whether the child should return to school or not? I mean, is if, if the parents can't decide, who, who, who makes that call? <laughs> so the president of the family law division gave some guidance on this. Um, because as it was all happening, it really wasn't very clear what the situation was. The president of family family law division has said, in a situation where parents can't agree, um, then one parent can make the call and just decide. However, that is likely to trigger the other parent to be incredibly unhappy, and they may then make an application to court. And in the situation where court proceedings are required or started, a judge would look at whether the deciding parent was reasonable in their decision making, um, whether they were well communicated in explaining that decision making process to the other parent, and whether they made any reasonable uh, proposals for alternative arrangements. And so you will be held to scrutiny is what the president has said. And so if parents can't decide and the deciding parent is going to be whoever's holding the child, really, whoever's holding the baby, because you can't make the decision and just send the child to school if the child's not in your care on that day. Um, So if, um, if the situation is where you say, for example, I want my child to go back to school and the other parent is saying, no, I don't think it's safe or I don't want them to for whatever reason, like, because I'm shield, I'm with someone who's shielding and if you send my child to school, it means they can't come and visit us. Mm. That's a common issue at the moment. Um, one parent could say, well, I'm going to send my child to school and just take them. Now, the other parent has got a few options, but, uh, you know, if they can't reach agreement, then court would be an application that would need to be made. And a judge would have to make that decision, looking at the decision process, who was reasonable, whether they were playing fairly, or are they using COVID as an excuse just to frustrate the yeah. child's relationship with the other parent? That's it's interesting. I mean, and also thinking about some of the practicalities of this, and you mentioned that you can still do meetings via Zoom and things, but mm-hmm. it must be very difficult for couples uh, who are considering a separation, particularly if one one sort of spouse is thinking about it, the other one isn't or isn't is blissfully unaware that their partner's thinking that way. It must be very difficult to start that communication process when you're both in the house together. There's, mm-hmm. there's little privacy. 
Uh, and maybe this again relates back a little bit to the sort of domestic abuse situation we've we've seen during the crisis too. So, so how practically do people start finding information, start that contact process when when they're living under the same roof the whole time? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Google is a brilliant thing. We've all got access to the internet if we've got a phone at least, and that can give some privacy. You can also look on your private browser, so you can look at websites and access information online without leaving a trail. Um, but yeah, if your partner's in the house or sitting next to you on the sofa, even that is, you know, potentially risky to do. Um, my book, my book is available to read. You can order it online. It'll get sent to your door. You can download the ebook. That's all accessible. Um, lawyers are all working. So most of my clients still do an initial approach to me via email. So sending me an email communication. But if you want to speak, I've had people, right, I'm going out for a walk at two o'clock today. Can you call me while I go out on my daily yeah. walk? And I'm talking to them while they're walking around a car park somewhere. Or they'll sit in their car and just have to say, I'm going to the shop and sit in their car for an hour and be on the phone with me. Um, so we're getting around it that way. It's, it's slightly better now that the rules are easing. It's slightly easier to find a reason to, to go out now that we're able to go out a little bit more frequently. But yeah, it has been difficult. But for most clients, um, the children's issues have been the higher um, higher percentage of my inquiries. They're already separated. So those have been fine because they're not together. It's mainly been kids interrupting um, and wondering in the background and things and just making sure that if I'm speaking with a client, the child can't really hear what they're saying. Um, so having the children with the headphones on, listening to an iPad or something. Mm. Um, and try and keep them in a separate room if possible. But I'm, I'm not in any way worried if children are interrupting. Um, and likewise, you know, a lot of my clients are going really well. I've got young children. Um, thankfully, my children have have not come in and popped up on a client call, but they are popping up on internal meetings and things, and and that's all been fine. Everyone's been really relaxed about that. Yeah, I think we're all just accepting the interruptions from family members are part part of the game now, aren't they? And um, I mean, this morning, my wife's taken our children out for the morning to see her sister. So they're now in the house, but she's left the dogs behind. So of course, if the delivery man comes to the door, they'll start barking in a second. Yeah. Can't really win at the moment. There we go. I love that though, because I don't normally see the children that I'm talking about. So course, I love yeah. that I actually get to see the children, you know, that... You know, I can be, I can spend, I can speak to a client every day for months on end and get to know them really well. And you become, you get such a great, great rapport and close relationship with them. And I never will see the children that I've spent all this time corresponding about. So it's wonderful if I do get a glimpse of them. I love it. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's a great, great sort of way to look at it, isn't it? Um, how do how do we keep children sort of front and center through this process? Because for couples who are separating or going through divorce who have got children, I mean, children clearly are, are one big aspect of this, as well as the finances and as well as the legal aspects of separation. But you know, kids are probably the ones who who are impacted upon the most by divorce and separation. How do we put them first? Well, we do because we have to. The law says the children are the um, primary concern and that their best interests are what guides the outcome. But obviously there's different interpretations of what what is in the child's best interests. And that's where we get contentious children's cases because what one parent thinks is in a child's best interest may differ to the other parents. It's really difficult because I I would say in every single case, both parents would think, well, I am putting my child at the front and center. Um, even if it's a highly contested case, they will believe what they are, what their position is, is for their child's best interests. Um, how do we do it so that it's less contentious? Is to try and remember that people have got to be amicable and co-parent because even if you've got very young children or teenagers, they, you don't just suddenly stop being a parent when they hit 18. You've got a long life ahead of you mm. of, of events special occasions and it's I'm very much about preserving that relationship that yes you may no longer love each other and want to be together but can we make it so that you can still be civil enough to be comfortable around each other for the sake of your children going forwards it doesn't always happen unfortunately but I would say I would say the majority of my cases people leave amicable enough that they're able to do that And so communication is really the important part of that, I think. I'm constantly saying, you know, are are you being reasonable? That's the the, the, the test is, Mm. 
about is this reasonable is this is this something that you're doing because your cut is coming from your emotion you know is this an emotive response or is this something that genuinely um you've got a concern which can't be overcome and therefore that's why your position is the correct one so being reasonable and being well explained and it's the communication that's really key I'm not one of those lawyers that's a fan of coming in and sending off a fiery letter to the other parent or spouse. Um, I'm, I'm increasingly helping clients write emails or text messages, it tends to be emails because they're longer, um, to their ex-partner. But I assist them in writing it. So it gives them confidence of knowing that uh, they, they, they know that in law their position is, mm. is okay and it's reasonable they've got the confidence of having had legal advice on it and someone else say yeah I think what you're saying is right and I think the tone is right that's important because especially when you're reading an email you infer the tone yourself don't you as you're reading it yeah. so trying our hardest to make sure the communication is reasonable appropriate the timing of correspondence you know don't send it on a birthday or um, just before Christmas, as we were speaking of before. Um, things like that, actually, are the practicalities of maintaining that relationship and knowing where to compromise. Um, and fundamentally, you know, as much as your view may be quite fixed um, and entrenched about something, if the children are okay and they're fine and they're going back and forth, actually it's probably more about timing and just allowing you some time to get used to the new norm. Mm. Um, and being mindful of that, actually, the human side of the, the, the breakdown of the, the relationship. And I, I find that human side very yeah, fascinating. I, I've been divorced. About 12 years ago, I was divorced. And um, whilst there were moments when I'm sure we both hated each other and wanted to sort of lash out, um, in the main, it went very amicably. And, and lots of our friends at the time said, you know, it was the model of how to do it well. But often, so often, we see examples, particularly on Facebook and on social media, of, of really nasty, vitriolic responses to... Oh. The, uh, how, how, what part does that play in the divorce process, particularly now we've got the yeah, prevalence of social media? What, what do you advise your sort of clients to, to think about before they post that Facebook <laughs> status? The advice is very clear. Write it as though a judge will read it. <laughs> Would you say that to a judge? Would you say that in front of a judge? Would you write that knowing that a judge could, if you then later end up at court and a judge reads that, how does that reflect on you? Um, an extreme example, but it is a, a real one nevertheless, a separated couple, uh, international couple, and the ex-wife did a post on Facebook about her ex-husband and his new partner. She then travelled to Dubai where he was, and I think the children were there, and she was arrested when she got there Gosh. because she breached the local laws by doing these posts about them so be mindful of what you're saying how you're saying it and you don't want to go into that harassment misuse of communications or anything like that those you know police could get involved um it's you know the general rule is don't do it it might feel better in that hot second, but it's it's not going to do you any favours. You don't need to egg or do a dirty laundry. Um, having a good support network is important, but you don't need to go to social media to, to mm. get that. No, I think that's good advice. Very good advice indeed. Now, um, you mentioned before we started recording that this week in Parliament, we've seen a new divorce bill go through finally. So tell, tell yeah. us a bit about that. What's happened? Oh, it's a long, very long awaited no fault divorce. So currently our laws are that you have to lay blame. So my spouse has committed adultery, they're to blame. My spouse has behaved unreasonably and you have to explain, you give examples of their unreasonable behaviour um, in order to get a divorce promptly. Otherwise you have to wait at least a period of two years. So it's very inflammatory. You know, we're doing the whole, let's be amicable, let's try and preserve your relationship. Mm. But actually, in order to start all of this, you've got to sling some mud at them first. <laughs> and so family lawyers and judges for years now have been crying out for a better way to, to start divorce proceedings that don't require you to be unkind about the other. So this has finally gone through. It's been years in the making. And it's a bill that says you can divorce or have a, um, a, a dissolution of your civil partnership 
by simply making a statement that says your marriage is irretrievably broken down. No further information mm. is required. It can be done jointly, which is also huge. So you can together go to court or, you know, apply online um, <laughs> and say to the court, we agree that our marriage has irretrievably broken down and we'd like a divorce. And isn't that wonderful to just be able to say without having to lay blame, slink any mud, be contentious, even have to say, well, who's going to divorce who? I don't want to be the person that's divorced because I don't think I've done anything wrong or I think we're both to blame. So why should one of us be divorced mm. against the other? It's brilliant that we can now do a, a joint application or you can still do it as one person applies, but you just have to say our marriage has irretrievably broken down all the same for a civil partnership. So it's a huge sea change. It's approved. It's gone all the way through the houses that, and it's, it's approved, but it's not yet law. So we need royal assent for it to then become real legislation and pe pe for people to then be able to do it. That's going to take some time just logistically to get it in place. The, the, the word on the street is it could be fairly soon, a month, but I think the reality is it's more like autumn. Um, so I've already had people say, well, should I hold off for a divorce on that basis? It depends on your circumstances. I would take legal advice. If you're thinking of divorce now, take legal advice about your options and your specific circumstances because you can't finalise a financial separation unless you've got divorce proceedings. So mm -hmm. it may be that in your circumstances, it's not worth waiting because we don't know for sure. There's no guarantee when it will happen. No, they're fantastic. And I know there was quite a high-profile high case as well, wasn't there, um, for a lady that was petitioning for divorce and her husband effectively wouldn't let her for various reasons. And, and this this is hopefully you know, making life easy for people in that situation. Yeah, they were the real highlighting case for this um, and an example of why you need to have this as an option for people. And my book is I think the first book and only book out there that covers this new bill. So for anyone wanting some information, you can go and have a look at my book or the government website. I haven't checked this morning. It literally only happened last night. I haven't checked this morning that there's information out there yet, but it will be coming, I'm sure. Yeah, well, by, by the time this episode goes live in a week or so, we'll make sure we, we look up any links to yeah, the government website and, and update that. But more importantly, we need to link to your book. So uh -huh. where do we get hold of a copy of a book? Is it, I would say normally all good bookshops, but right now that's not really an option, is it? I think, I don't know, are they now back open? I haven't checked what shops are open at the weekend. But yeah, so all good bookshops. The usual, anywhere that's doing online retail books, um, you can order it online. Um, of course, Amazon, um, and you can download it. So it's available at all of those those places. But if you Google um, my name and Penguin, the Penguin website gives you all the links to where you can download it. But it's effectively... My, my idea behind the book is to feel like an initial meeting with a family lawyer. So... In that initial meeting, what do we cover? We cover what your options are. Is this really what you want? Do you want the separation? If you don't, what are your options? What can we do to help you reconcile? Um, what are your options if you do want to separate? And the different, you know, not everyone has to divorce. So what are those different stages and what, what's available to you? Uh, what if things get nasty? So I cover, you know, how to deal with com communication issues, etc. Um, and then I talk through the financial and children's side of things. So how the courts will look at financial separation. Um, because we don't have a formulaic law here, it's very much discretionary and no two cases are the same. So explaining how the laws ap apply to financial separation so that the reader can apply that themselves to their, what they know of their circumstances. Um, and child arrangements, obviously, it's a huge concern for any parent going through a separation, married or unmarried. Um, and how the laws apply there, how to just try and do it yourself, how to be um, decent, how to communicate, all of those main points are covered. Um, and I also cover unmarried couples because separating if you're not married is very different to if you are married. So mm. all in there. Well, Laura, thank you for your time today. And I hope by listening to this conversation, our listeners will realise that family lawyers are not you know, scary people, they're, they're approachable and they're, they're friendly. And, and, and it's not, you know, whilst it's a, a difficult situation to go through for any couple, um, actually approaching a professional like you shouldn't put them off, you know, um, taking that first step. So thank, thank you for sharing your, your wisdom with us today. Um, we'll make sure we put links in, in the show notes for your book and, and to you at uh, Pennington's as well. Um, but no, it's been a pleasure chatting. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And also, you can find me on Instagram because for that exact reason that you've just said, family lawyers aren't scary, horrid professionals. I have an Insta- Instagram account at The Family Lawyer where people can access information from me, but also see that I'm a real human and that um, they can get a feel for me before they reach out. So if anyone's on Instagram, go and take a look at my page for them. Fab. I'll make sure I follow you right away. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Laura, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. A big thank you to Laura for joining us for this episode of Informed Choice Radio. I hope you found that useful if you're listening and if that conversation applied to your current circumstances as well. I know that divorce and separation is an incredibly difficult time, an incredibly difficult life event, having been through it personally myself, but also having worked with numerous clients over the years who have been through divorce too. I think what I really drew from that conversation, lots and lots of insights, of course, from Laura there, but one really important one, which I I alluded to right at the end was family law professionals like Laura these are approachable friendly knowledgeable helpful individuals and something I've often thought is people put off dealing with their finances because they're worried that financial planners like me and my colleagues are scary and of course we're not and it's just the same if not worse with solicitors in many cases people don't want to go and see a solicitor because they're worried about sharing their personal circumstances and their emotions and their worries with them but hopefully that conversation with Laura today will just give you some reassurance that people like Laura are absolutely wonderful. They're fantastic. They are friendly. They are approachable. They're a real source of help and security at a difficult time. So if that is your situation, definitely pick up a copy of Laura's book, The Family Lawyer's Guide to Separation and Divorce. And of course, pick up the phone as well to Laura, one of her colleagues, and get the advice you need. Thank you for listening to this episode of Informed Choice Radio. Until next time, I'm Martin Bamford. This is Informed Choice Radio. And remember, when it comes to your money, the more you know, the faster it can grow.